Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me today at this session of the um, Lister Research Summit. And thank you to all the organisers for um, allowing me this up to half an hour um, talking about the Lister coat of arms. Um, again, thanks for joining. So I'll be talking about the Lister coat of arms, the uh, history, background and design of the, the arms. Um, here's a quick overview. I'll be giving um, a short introduction how I got into this topic. Um, the College of Arms and Heraldry. The importance of um, the coat of arms to Anne Lister alongside her um, very great awareness of her own status in society and why she would be interested in the coat of arms. I'll then move on to the actual arms, how they look, uh, what they look like and uh, a brief history. And then talk about the component parts. There are quite a few specialist heraldic terms and just a few of those have a, a meaning, but they or they all have a particular, almost a translation because of very technical historical meaning of the what words to the parts of the coats of arms. <clears throat> then I'll be talking about where we can see them and hopefully others may have seen um, the coats of arms in places I haven't. So I'd be keen to hear about those. Um, and then have a quick conclusion. And um, at the end, there will be a Q and A um, on Zoom, there's a raise your hand function, which is a little blue hand icon. Uh, most of you may be familiar with that. It's a little blue hand next to the camera icon. <clears throat> but also, if you don't have that, you can scroll to the bottom of the participants list. And you should see uh, just a raise your hand in text there. <clears throat> So the quick introduction, um, where do I come into this? Um, like so many of us, I absolutely loved Gentleman Jack, the TV series, um, and Shoma's book that went alongside it was incredible. And reading that in particular just made me want to learn more and more about Anne. And I think that's been the experience of so many of us. Um, that led me to just a Google Dan Lister all over the place and luckily came across the West Yorkshire Archive Service uh, transcription project, uh, which I started to take part in in summer 2019, which seems a long time ago now. To, um, and then all of that interest, the uh, series, the book, being involved in the project led me up to Shipton Hall in autumn last year. I was very, very lucky to visit them. Uh, looking around Shipton Hall, um, I just absolutely loved the house and the estate. And we know that the house was um, first recorded in 1420, and we've got the 600 year anniversary next year. Um, and it came into the Lister family by marriage in 1619. Um, although uh, Anne was in some ways quite ashamed of uh, Shibden, uh, called it shabby little Shibden, and um, you know, didn't have her aristocratic friends there, she also loved it very much and she made many changes to the hall and to the estate. Um, including improving the main house body, that well, the main hall of the house, where she raised the ceiling, built in a grand staircase, put in a fireplace, lots of oak panelling, put in her initials, she put in a the family motto. But she also included in that, at the bottom of the stairs, a large lion, uh, which was holding a shield. And I also came across this field in, by the entrance to, main entrance to the estate um, and in the ceiling of Halifax Minster. So this repeated shield theme made me curious about the, how it was designed, what the component parts meant. And on this slide here, you have um, 
the shield part of the coats of arms and it's, it's embedded in stone and I can't remember where in Shibden Hall that is so um, definitely necessitates another visit. So this recurring theme, this um, the lions and the crest that I saw in uh, Halifax Minster, um, I asked about it and couldn't find out any particular meaning of the coat of arms. So I decided to contact the College of Arms in, here in England. And that is the official heraldic authority, authority for England and Wales, Northern Ireland, and many Commonwealth countries. It was founded in 1484 by King Richard III. And this authority um, has the responsibility of granting coats of arms and it maintains a register of all of those and oversees them. It uh, maintains registers of pedigrees, genealogies and so on. Um, and I, I was so, um, didn't know really anything about this topic. So I even looked up, uh, well, what is heraldry? And heraldry is a sort of system that captures the use, display and regulation of hereditary symbols. Um, and it's used to distinguish individuals, armies, institutions, corporations, and that kind of thing. Part of the regulation and knowledge of all the coats of arms was um, by heralds. And the heralds um, are officials who uh, granted coats of arms, they um, oversee the use to know and recognise and record coats of arms and nowadays still regulate them. And so what is a coat of arms? It's a hereditary device typically born on a shield um, that has a very medieval history um, wrapped up in the chivalry of medieval times and the terminology is very obscure and there are various arcane meanings, uh, which I'll go on uh, to discuss later on. The system of heraldry in the coats of arms was developed in Northern Europe in about the mid 12th century. So it goes back a very long way. And its purpose then was to um, help recognition literally on the battlefield or in more peaceful times, um, recognition in sporting contests such as jousting is probably one of the most famous. You could e you easily recognize the person that you're supporting in a joust. So heraldic um, devices such as the coat of arms were the perfect status symbol and they um, projected a person's wealth and prowess on a battlefield or in a, a jousting or other tournament. The um, heraldic um, coat of arms or the heraldic system of picture almost was inheritable like um, land or titles and typically passed from father to son uh, and therefore could be, um, they were used as a sort of uh, indicator of a specific lineage of a family and different family branches could be distinguished by having basically the same coat of arms but with small variations on the theme. So this um, being a very important status symbol uh, ties in very nicely with Anne Lister and we know that her status was something she was incredibly conscious of and it was a very important thing to her. And she, I found that she um, was thinking about the coat of arms and her pedigree, et cetera, over most, if, much of, if not most of all of her adult life. Um, I've seen at least a couple of diary entries. Um, she was writing to the College of Arms um, back in 1817 when she was just 25, um, writing to them about the family motto. Uh, five years later, she was at a solicitor's office at the Minster Yard in York, 
wanting to review some old wills. I think she read 11 wills there in a couple of hours, hoping to find some information about the pedigree. And she was not really very satisfied with what she found. But uh, wills in those days, I mean, even now they don't make for very fun reading. And I think in those days they had very much more technical language. So reading 11 in two hours is pretty good going. 12 years later, she wrote to Mariana Lawton, uh, Shibden is my own place where my family had lived for two to three centuries. And she felt that she was the 15th generation of her to family to bear the Lister name. And indeed, part of the information I um, obtained from the College of Arms was that Anne Lister herself signed and certified the pedigree that they had prepared in November 1838. So the heralds that I mentioned, the um, officials who um, grant and record and regulate coats of arms, they visited um, each county across England for uh, roughly 150 years, um, approximately every generation, uh, to oversee the coats of arms that, and um, granting them and recording them and to check how they were used. And the College of Arms told me that in uh, 1666, the Heralds visited Yorkshire including Shibden Hall, where they um, recorded a pedigree um, at that time going back four generations. And at that visit, they confirmed the arms to the Lister family. In 1838, a pedigree of 13 generations was placed on record. And the pedigree was headed by Richard Lister of Halifax, who Anne mentioned when she is searching through the wills and he was living in the mid 15th century. The pedigree contains many branches in fact, uh, but the central one leads to Jeremy Lister, um, Anne's father and, and to Anne. Um, another uh, branch actually led down to John Lister, and we know he was a slightly different family um, who did so much to bring Anne Lister to us today effectively. So as I just mentioned, the College of Arms did confirm that Anne Lister herself um, signed as true the pedigree, uh, which had been completed in 1817 and was amended in 1838. The college said that that's quite unusual to um, amend um, a coat of arms and I can't help wondering whether Anne being as exacting as she was a, a person um, insisted on some changes. So going back to my initial interest in this topic, uh, my inquiry to the college was, well, what's the meaning of the coat of arms and the symbols on the coat of arms? So, so let's explore those things. So here we have um, a photograph of the coat of arms that I took um, in uh, October, November last year. Um, in fact, the coat of arms is composed of a crest and um, the arms and the crest is the part at the top there. It looks like a stag's head. And I'll go into more detail on that. Um, and the arms section is the bit that looks to us a bit like a shield. So the official description at the College of Arms using the slightly arcane language that they do of the crest part is upon a wreath of the colours, a stag's head, a raised cropper charged with a trefoil goose. Now I will go into some of these components um, which have a little bit more to say about them but the bit uh, which is the wreath uh, that's the thing that looks like a twisted rope underneath the bottom of the stag's head 
and it's um, in two colours. That is the wreath of the colours, and there the meaning of the colours is the main colours of the coat of arms, and you can see that that is the red and the rather off-white. It looks a bit yellow in this photo, but that's an off-white, and it's the colours that are used in the wreath under the stag's head. The um, now the trefoil goose. That is the trefoil is a three-leafed plant, and it's supposed to show on this um, stag's head this trefoil. But I couldn't see it there. The arms um, is officially ermine on a fess sable, three mullets or canton goose. So I'll go on to some of those elements in the next slide. So the stag's head, which is the crest, it um, is the stag's head is uh, representative of wisdom and long life. Um, Anne was rather wise, I think. She was many, many things. And I think wise was one of them. Some of her writings really are so powerful and insightful. Um, even still today, and so beautifully written. I think she was a wise person. Sadly, she did not have a long life, but she packed into that life more than most of us ever, ever do. The erased proper terminology is um, erased means um, basically the ragged edge at the bottom of the neck there. You can see a zigzag zag pattern and um, it's meant to signify that the head was ripped away or torn away from the body. The word proper here just simply means that the thing, the stag's head, is represented in its realistic colour. So it, it's a brown stag typically, and the depiction is in the colour brown. So they just use the word proper to indicate that. So here um, we have a part of the arms, so the shield looking part of the coat of arms. Um, and that is, as I said, officially ermine on a fess sable, three mullets or. Um, the ermine is the white fur of a stoat, which it has in the winter. And on that fur in a stoat, the tips of the white are colored black and these um, little black marks that look like a, an arrow almost are supposed to represent the black tips of the ermine fur. And on a fess sable, three mullets or you have fess is basically the black band, which is across the middle of the field. S uh, sorry, fess is a band, sable is black. The three mullets are the three stars, and or is the colour gold. So just this uh, language again that is used in heraldry. And the Canton Gauls, this is fairly interesting. Um, Canton is just the red square that is at the, sorry, the, the Canton is the square in uh, the top left of the shield. And gules is the colour, so that is the colour red. So you have a red square, and that um, is interesting because that is what distinguished Anne Lister's coat of arms from other um, coats of arms of other Lister families. So there were other Lister families in Yorkshire and Northern England who had the same coat of arms but without this red square in the corner. So if you ever see those, those would not be um, and, and this is branch of the family. So where can we see these uh, representations of the coats of arms? Um, many of you will have seen these um, first the stone lion at the entrance to really way very near um, Shipton Hall on the estate. It was uh, co carved in 1837 by Anne, uh, uh, at Anne's instruction. The lion at the bottom of the stairs in the house body, um, I don't know what year that was carved, but 
but it was done for Anne and that's made from Norwegian oak. So I think that's a good quality oak. Also, you can see this, as I mentioned at the beginning in Halifax Minster, which was ever so interesting. There's so much to see there. And um, I just happened to look up into the ceiling, the wooden ceiling of part of the Minster. And there were all these um, coats of arms, um, including that one that you can see in the centre there, which is Anne Lister's coat of arms, um, all of them in wood. Anne was very precise in everything that she did. And um, in, uh, in this sort of genealogy of pedigree, coats of arms, etc. Um, just a little bit of background to this quote here, um, where she ended up making Marion cry. Um, they, the family um, had received a letter from a captain mister, spelt with a Y, uh, who wanted to know about the family's pedigree. The letter had come in to Anne's father, but Anne took it upon herself to reply to him. I think she wanted a really good reply. Um, Marion had also had a go at writing um, a letter to this Captain Lister with a Y, but she'd made some assertions in it, which to Anne's annoyance um, would not have been provable. So she didn't think that Marion should have um, said this in the letter. And she ends this little bit from the journal in 1828. Somehow I, had, somehow I never talked to Marion however well intendedly and kindly, uh, but it ends in her crying. So they had a few tears about this uh, pedigree of theirs. So the meaning um, at the beginning I explained, I wanted to know the meaning of this coat of arms and all the symbols on it. The College of Arms told me that the meaning behind the designs of coats of arms is very rarely recorded if there was ever any meaning at all. Um, the earliest and simplest coat of arms were really devised to, as I said earlier, be a, help you to be identified on the battlefield or in a jousting or other tournament. And to put it in very good context, the college said that they usually bore no more meaning than a, a jockey's colours these days or a football, football shirt, just really for recognition. Um, Anne was, as we say, as I said, very um, precise in everything. So she may well have had some thoughts about what um, things on her coats of arms were meant to indicate. Uh, luckily, um, I joined the uh, West, West Yorkshire Archive Service discussion on Friday. And they said that one of the many bundles of paper that were found in Shipton Hall um, were and worked through, I think by Mira Green, were the um, papers which were correspondence between Listers, that's Anne Lister and James Lister, and I assume that was her uncle, uh, correspondence with the College of Arms. So if anyone's interested, they could ask the archive service. I certainly will be doing that. Um, and I can give you the email address that they uh, shared if, if you'd like that. Um, so that's really the end of what I have to say about the coats of arms. If you have any questions, I'll happily try to answer them. But really, um, maybe I've given you the extent of what I know, but I can always try. Okay, so everyone, if you have any questions, please use the raise hand function at the bottom of the participants panel, uh, and then we will hopefully answer your question. I'm not very good at Zoom, so I'm not seeing any um, Okay, so I'll give, you a, I'll give you a hand with this. Uh, Lucia, <laughs> would you like to unmute? So 
thank you, Lynn, and, and it was a, it was a great, uh, great explanation of uh, this coat of arms and, and a general overview. Uh, okay, now I, it's fine. Um, what I wanted to ask you is um, about the the background of the of this coat of arms. Uh, the uh, the air mine. Um, we see those uh, signs. The 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 well the they look like arrows on, on my screen actually with the three dots. Or so, um, uh, is there a number, uh, a specific number, or is that a pattern that was given well, or used uh, uh, by then or something? As that as that as their number of those signs a specific value or uh, what? Thank you. Um, that's a, a really good question. Thank you. Um, I don't know. I actually don't know how many are on that coat of arms. Um, it could easily, we could easily find out by counting, of course, but whether the number has anything uh, particular to say or signify, um, I doubt, given what the um, College of Arms said to me about the symbolism generally. Um, it may be just that it sort of looked nice in the actual design that was there. Thank you, Lynn. Um, uh, Patricia, would you like to unmute? I, I was curious about the relationship to the motto of the co coat of arms. And is, did that have any uh, approval process as well? That's also a really good question. Thank you. Um, I, I don't know that there's any um, reflection in the coat of arms itself of the motto. Um, that is uh, something that I would like to explore with the um, West Yorkshire Archive Service if um, they have any uh, well, they do have papers. So I'd really like to get hold of those if at all possible. Um, and, uh, you know, Anne was very thoughtful um, and so exacting about everything um, that there may well be some connection in her mind. Okay, so one final one. Uh, Lynn, would you like to unmute? Can you try again, Lynn, please? Okay. Is that right? Um, I'm speaking okay then? Yeah. Yeah. A um, couple of things. I can't flip the screen, so I'm not going to try. But when I looked, I found um, the coat of arms of West Yorkshire, of West Yorkshire County Council. And that got me into looking at the um the tufts on the lister because they're on the yorkshire one as well and when i did the research i found out that the the symbol that looks a bit like um you know the, the black of the ermine apparently the, the 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 two like spikes are actually nails because they're the nails that you would put the skins out on you know to dry them I can't remember what they're called, um, but if you look on the wiki link, it's there. Um, the other one, of course, is this, this tuft hunter joke about Anne um, Lister, you know, wanting to go up in society. Um, and the other thing was the fact that it's got red on it. Is that to do with the Lancashire connection? Because normally a Yorkshire family wouldn't use red. They would use white, obviously, but they're not a Yorkshire family for listed. And it is in the northwest corner. So I wonder if there's some visual link to Lancashire by using the colour red, which, as you said, they don't have any meaning, but it did occur to me that whether there was some difference between the historic Lancashire Lister and to differentiate it from the Yorkshire Lister. They were just thoughts. No, I think they're really interesting. I mean, that gives me some thoughts to go and um, try to explore with the archive service and the letters um, that Anne shared and just thinking about Anne being so precise and exacting really about everything that she did. The Lancashire um, is your own idea. 
I'd yeah. really love to um, have a think about that and explore that. It seems really sensible I've got some... kind of ideas. All right. Uh, sorry, everyone. We're at uh, time. Oh. So let's just thank Lynn and then move on to Lister Bingo. Uh, thank you. Thanks very much, everyone. I really appreciate you joining me. Thank you.